Okay. Uh, first slide. One second. All right. Okay. So this is a brief overview of uh, what we're going to talk about. And I'm not going to go through this. Just going to give you a heads up that uh, uh, we're actually going to talk about a couple technologies um, over a range of weight bands. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So if you were do a, if you were do if you were to do a survey or census of the electromagnetic spectrum, as a astrophysicist, this is my, what you might find. At the low end, there's uh, is there a pointer here? the low end, you have the cosmic microwave in, uh, background, the cosmic infrared background, cosmic optical background, and the x-ray background. And most of the photons are in this low end. And they are very interesting um, in terms of how, uh, controlling the, they're interesting for several reasons. So the next slide, please. So they're, the far infrared um, you're, is used for a variety of reasons, which are listed there, and I'll let you read that. Uh, but perhaps more important to me, from my interest, is uh, how does star, initial star formation and um, how does this, how do the early heavy elements um, come about? When and what time, under what conditions were the heavy elements created? And uh, what are the processes and AGNs? Okay. And more importantly, are the cosmological, it's a wonderful probe of cosmology because it lets us look back to the earliest um, times. Next slide, please. So here's a, a picture, and I want to step to the next slide and just look at how the sky, this is the galactic center, how it looks in different wave bands going from there, and one more. And these, and those are largely foregrounds. We don't look in the galactic center when we can, but they're largely foregrounds for a lot of things we're interested in doing. And um, in looking at uh, the Big Bang, um, it was originally a, a very hot um, initial conduct conditions, and uh, the measured fluctuations are consistent with a very simple model. Um, it's called Lambda CDM, which I don't know if you are aware of, uh, it's, but anyway, that's what it's called. Uh, <laughs> and uh, which the universe was co composed primarily of dark energy and dark matter. The CMB photons observed today were from the su surface of laugh scattering. And uh, when, this, when the early universe transitioned from being uh, optically thick plasma to being transparent. And during that period, um, a lot the information about the density and uh, the um, composition of the universe is encoded in that plasma. Okay, next slide, please. This is a recent um, uh, map made by the Planck satellite. And what's of more interest now, the, this is in temperature. Um, and it's, um, this made, Planck made a full sky survey of the sky. Are these images here, which is the um, polarization, that's a, the hot and cold spots in so-called E mode, which is a jargon for something looks like an E vector, it's radially inward. Um, and they've been detected, okay? And in this picture, they're consistent with this Lambda CDM model, but perhaps, and that's induced by scattering off the, um, the Compton scattering off of, uh, of a warm and cold, uh, dense and under dense regions of the early universe. But the, there's another um, symmetry, which one could look for, and that would be a B mode or a curl-like symmetry in it uh, under certain uh, cosmologies uh, would be present. So go to the next slide, please. Um, in addition to that, we can use, we, we can pretend um, uh, that the CMB fluctuations that we map are our standard candle, and we can um, consider the lensing from material between that last um, scattering surface and between the observed sky today, and we can try and undo that. And that allows us, that, that de-lensing process um, is a very interesting prospect. Um, the lensing creates correlations or deflections uh, in the radiation on degree scales today. Um, these, these, the, that light, um, studying the properties of that, of that, of the power spectrum allow us to look for 
um, essentially allows you to do high energy particle physics. It set constraints on neutrinos and um, other uh, processes that the dense, the matter density and dark matter. The next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, uh, a uh, collection of um, the most current um, data. Uh, if your favorite experiment is not there, I apologize. I, in the interest of, of um, having it in a finite amount. But the upper one is um, the Planck data. These are the, the temperature, temperature fluctuations. This essentially, the axis here is like one over angle. This is the largest angles on the sky, and that's the smallest. And um, this is the E mode this radially type symmetry in polarization. This is unpolarized light. And what we're interested in now is to find out if this B mode type behavior is there. And that will tell us about the earliest um, times of inflation. It's, in effect, you're using the properties of the light to serve as a, as a gravity, wave scale, gravity wave detector on the larger scales. Next slide, please. So you could ask, how do you do all these um, measurements? And to be honest, it's hard. And um, uh, these detectors, um, this particular detector, this is the ACT uh, from the ACTPO collaboration. This is a t uh, their telescope. There's a cryostat here. Um, these detectors run at 100 millikelvin, and they look out into this, this particular telescope is in the Atacama uh, Desert. Um, if you were to fly this from a balloon, there'd be other complications if you were to fly it from space. But the bottom line is um, it's, it's a TEAS-based detector array, uh, polarization-sensitive uh, uh, polarimeter with multiple elements. And it's running at 100 millikelvin, and somehow you need to go from 100 millikelvin to a more, um, through a warmer um, uh, temperature, in the case of this telescope, to 300 kelvin, without loading the detector or spoiling its noise properties. And so there's all kinds of little engineering problems that arise in that context. And uh, let's go to the next slide. So we want to think about, I'm not going to talk about TS detectors and that. I'm going to talk about some of the minutia of uh, how do you do that. And um, metamaterials in general are just engineered materials or terrible materials that have properties. They're not readily found in nature. And you could say, well, you don't find Teflon in nature. So why is Teflon you know, one of the ones I put there? Um, in, in general, like the, the Teflon is there is actually has a controlled pore size, and that's why I've included it. Um, I kind of use the, the they're also two-dimensional metamaterials, which are like, you can imagine metal or printed circuit things that are printed, and we're not gonna talk about those. These materials um, uh, fall into the category, you can, uh, you control their, by, by controlling their properties, either like, um, you, typically you try and have them do one or more uh, enhance one or more elect, uh, properties. Maybe you want to make it lighter. Maybe you want to make it have a certain optical property. Maybe you want to have it have certain mechanical properties. And this is important if you're trying to cool something down. If you have a large uh, silicon lens or something like that, you might not want it to break. Um, and some of them are the various techniques that are made, like these are made by uh, chemical, uh, essentially etching. This is made by laser-assisted etching. This is done by DRE, and this is um, by similar micromachining processes. Um, some of these, like these nanoparticles, are made by essentially just uh, controlling the chemistry in a way to generate particles of a certain size. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so one of the problems uh, which we'd like to solve is we have, um, we want to have many, many detectors. We want to make a very large field of view instrument, and we ha want to have many detectors looking at the size, sky simultaneously. And um, uh, due to, we all have computers, uh, large chunks of silicon are readily available, more or less, industrially. You can get a 30 mil centimeter piece of silicon, and that's a reasonable material to make a lens out of in the uh, far end far infrared. And um, the kind of the traditional way of, of, of making um, an AR coating is you essentially glue material or layers of material and make a composite material. And next slide, please. The problem with that is that the stresses that are built up in that uh, tend to you know, pull chunks of material out of the lens and cause other kinds of issues. It also can deform the very shape of the lens, and that's bad. So what we looked at here, um, 
is an alternative solution. Uh, we make sub-wavelength features to realize the multi-layer coding. And um, this, um, uh, at University of Michigan, uh, they uh, essentially built a gantry. It's a three-axis uh, dicing saw mounted on a gantry with one mil accuracy um, to um, realize these kind of structures. And you could say, well, um, that's the other thing I didn't mention. In, in making a millimeter wave coating, like the CMB is peaked around 150 gigahertz, so it's kind of millimeter wave radiation. Uh, one of the problems is it's so f the coating you would want, to, or the not the control, the control structure for controlling reflections is actually relatively thick, and um, that is another challenge. Whereas if you went to the optical or something, you'd be like, okay, I'm not, I can live with that. Okay, so. Um, the strengths of doing this are it gives you precision control over the index of refraction, and ability to create multiple layers in uh, a single, over a large area, and uh, others that are there. But in particular, I want this volumetric metamaterials. They can achieve a higher bandwidth than their planar counterparts. You can imagine doing the same thing by stacking, and uh, you'll find that in the end you're going to need a lot of layers to do that. So this is a very um, efficient um, approach to carrying this out. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's a simple example of uh, the, the upper uh, is kind of showing the basic idea. This is a cartoon, it isn't what we actually do. But you could imagine drilling holes or having rods um, and attaching that layer to a bulk material and have another material. And, that, and that's really good in this situation because if we're gonna cool something from room temperature to um, you know, 100 millikelvin or even four Kelvin, to be fair, I'm not going to 100 millikelvin, four Kelvin. Um, three Kelvin, something like that. This uh, is all the same material, so you're not gonna have all kinds of, uh, there's not gonna be a lot of stress in the structure. Next slide, please. And um, so you can kind of, to Zerth, or you can just think about it as a function of the filling fraction, there's some effective dielectric constant that you're achieving. Um, okay, next slide. So you can, by playing with that, um, the filling fraction, you can realize any value you want. Now, if the, if the pitch between the various objects um, becomes a less, you know, becomes too large, you'll diffract. Uh, you could look at that as a feature or a problem, depending on how you, how you uh, view it, but it is a reality. Uh, so, uh, because it's essentially, as you go to really high wavelengths, it's gonna, the material's gonna scatter um, light, which could help you or hurt you, depending on how you did the rest of your optical design. But you need to keep it in mind what's gonna happen out of the band. Um, a lot of the structures we make, um, uh, actually are, which were made at Michigan and designed, uh, the designs we're exploring, they are, they have a very large uh, fractional bandwidth that they operate over. Uh, so you start with a big 30 inch, 30, not inch, 30 centimeter piece of silicon. Next slide, please. And um, here's a uh, graduate student. He's uh, diligently uh, operating the machine which he designed and built. It's controlled to a, a fraction of a Kelvin in the room uh, to get the tolerance he wants. And um, it's essentially going through and cutting on this uh, after the, sh the, after the uh, shape of the lens has been formed. Next slide, please. And here are uh, pictures of the final finished lens. Um, and uh, it's incredibly, uh, it, it holds our tolerance, the uniformity of the material both, you have to cut it uniformly in X and Y, otherwise it'll become birefringent. Um, so you could use that to your advantage if you so wanted to make something was, but in our case for this particular application, we do not want it to be, uh, we do not want it to be, have a birefringence or by attenuance. Okay, next slide please. And here is um, the actual end part compared with theory and model. Uh, it works out very well. These, uh, de these lenses have been deployed and have been used in the field now at this point. They're more chemically robust and um, uh, you just don't want people picking them up and playing with them, but they're in the, <laughs> they, they, they handle transport to the telescope fine and they're, they are useful once they're mounted. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a really nice photograph of a demonstration of a five layer coating. And uh, it's the fractional, the band it work, operates over five to one band. Um, it's a kind of approximating a little uh, cone over the, um, type thing. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, here's another approach um, we tried a few years ago and we've kind of revisited it. This is uh, one that's larger. We actually have made much smaller ones now um, for more like 20 micron work. Um, but it's essentially a, a DRE, uh, so essentially a silicon micro machine hex of a finite length. And you can see at really long wavelengths, it's acting very well as a homogeneous dielectric. And as you go higher in frequency, there's some uh, dispersion. Um, and if you go high enough, you start seeing resonances in the structure. But we'd normally use it kind of in this range down here. And uh, next slide, please. If you take that into account in the design of the next layer, you can, um, it works out fine. So another structure of interest where metamaterials can maybe help you out is if you have something that's really cold and that you want to put it next to something that isn't so cold and you don't want to have a large um, thermal load on the cryostat. Um, uh, for systems with waveguides in them, uh, this is an important consideration. Um, back when I was in graduate school, you'd take a piece of stainless steel and you'd put the flanges on it and the wasps in that guide were tended to be the dominant error in making uh, and using um, receivers of that type. Calibrating that out was uh, for noise measurements was tricky, even if you plate the inside. You, you ended up having a longer length than you'd want to have. And um, so with this approach, um, essentially you could the, uh, imagine two waveguide flanges that come very close together. If you work with waveguides, what I just said would scare you, because if you know a little, little tiny gap, it leaks out of it. So what you do to get around that is you make, um, this is the two flanges coming together. You put a pattern of little pillars, and that pattern essentially lets light go, um, doesn't let light go radially away from the waveguide, which is in the center. The waveguide's running along this axis. And if you think about it as a pattern of mirrors, you can mirror all the ones above, and it makes an infinite array that way. And in the end, you have a Essentially, if you mirror all the ones down, you have going below. And what you've done is you've replaced the walls of the waveguide in this house of mirrors by these pillars, which do not let light go laterally. And the waveguide ends up being a defect. Um, this works really well. Um, and Jeffrey Hetzler, uh, I believe at UVA, made a structure along like this, along this line in um, quite some time ago in, in um, a two to one aspect ratio guide. And the thing that's special about this one, this, this particular design, is it actually allows you to have both polarizations without loading either one. Um, so, and you can, and if you don't want, if you want them to touch, you allow them to touch, it works with lower loss than the other type of, uh, than a traditional flange would work. Uh, you can use it in a split block. We actually uh, make, we've micro-machined some of these out of silicon. Um, this pattern into the interface layers, and we built circuits inside in the gaps that uh, exist in between. So it's a very nice packeting solution um, if, for if you have, if you want waveguide structures very close to um, microstrip or other transmission line structures. Next slide, please. And this shows um, for this particular design. Um, and these, these are the pieces that were tested. Um, this shows the response of the stop band. Uh, next slide, please. But that's a narrow band because it's a, a ser only one set of scale that's setting the, the band. But you can repeat that and do that multiple times, and you can do a larger one. This was done by an uh, undergrad student as a project. And this is a scale model for a package that was built at 300 gigahertz where um, so bolometers, essentially any light that hits them, they're going to absorb, and that's a problem. So a problem when you're building bolometers on the low side, on the, in a waveguide-mounted bolometer, the low side is pretty well protected because it has a waveguide cutoff. It's, all the light is reflected away. But on the high side, where you're multi-moded, you actually need to worry about what's happening over a huge um, bandwidth um, because it, the blue leak light that gets in can degrade the performance of your detector. And, um, and uh, we've also made ver variants of this where we've, uh, instead of this is being doing it reflectively, um, but if you're cold enough, and uh, you can also do this with uh, lossy media incorporated in the design, and that works well also. Next slide, please. Okay. So one last thing I want to talk about is um, the use of metamaterials and absorptive structures. And... Uh, so if you're going to build an absorber, it needs to be compatible with what you're going to do. Like it has to have the right heat capacity and you know, electrical properties so it actually absorbs lights. 
And as you go over that band I showed you at the beginning, kind of from the, you know, the, uh, um, you know, 10 centimeters to, you know, uh, 20 microns is probably the range I had highlighted in green, something like that. Um, a reasonable solution is you say, oh, I'm just going to make a thin film resistor. But if you go and do that, and you say, well, how much gold is that? Or whatever you pick is your favorite metal. You're going to find out it's pretty thin. And uh, you may find out that it isn't very stable because the target impedance you're going to want to make um, out of the type of materials you can use. So there's one, uh, one other thing. You have, it, I'm in saying this, I'm saying I'm not going to make a resistor to make a cell phone. Okay, I'm going to make a resistor that I'm going to cool to 100 millikelvin. I don't want its value at room temperature to be significantly different than it is cold. I want it to have a, be a disordered alloy. And so the, the, it turns out that that's actually hard to do. So largely what we do is there are values you can hit that are stable and have all these nice properties and you pattern the materials to do that, but then you're kind of introducing um, the fraction into the problem. But patterning in itself is a two-dimensional metamaterial. Um, you can think of it that way. Um, so um, these volumetric things, um, they, it turns out they have a nice property that in, along their axis, um, you think about it, where they're, they're kind of adiabatically coupling to the light, they actually um, are very effective. So they, they, they do have a place. I wouldn't say they're used everywhere, but they're places where they actually make sense. Okay, and the, in particular, they're useful for uh, calibration targets and calibration standards because they're calculable, they're insensitive to their fabrication product, properties, and, um, and you can, I'll show you one in a minute, where you can, you can understand their temperature profile very, very well. And they're also use, useful in glint reduction and baffling because you can make them in a way where they're insensitive to how you make them and they still work and also for passive cooling in some cases. Okay, next slide, please. So here's an example of a calibrator that was made um, in my lab by a student who, uh, he, he made a, a calibration stand. This stretch here has been top, pulled to, to emphasize what's going on. Because to be honest, if you looked at this particular one um, with your eye, you wouldn't see hardly anything at all. Um, you'd have to look pretty hard to tell. So the stretch has been changed here so you can see. So he made this calibration standard and it turns out he came back and he said, well, this isn't black enough. And, um, and so he was interested in um, making this. So we made these little uh, targets. These are all flats and we look at the various materials. And these are conversion coatings on these lower ones. And um, that is a, um, that's a typical black paint that you might use in the far infrared, in, not in the far infrared, in the, the optical. Um, is where it's normally used. It's Z3, uh, 3CO6. And uh, so anyway, this is the standard thing that you would normally get if you went to and you went to a company and bought a calibration standard for your FTS. That's what they would give you. In fact, one of those is one of that is that, <laughs> and one of those lines. And this is what the structure was able to achieve. And this is about a factor of 50 difference in performance. But the main reason why it was done was not because of that. That isn't why it was done. Because to be honest, we want to make it blacker. We know how to make it blacker than this. Um, it was done because in his application, he wanted to run this, and he wanted to know the temperature gradient across this, and he wanted it to be very small. And it turns out this was done with a metal backing behind it. Uh, a, uh, and um, so, you know, tailing the structure shape is another example of how it can really help you if you think, about, think through the physics of what's going on. Next slide, please. Okay, um, this is kind of an interesting structure here. This, the reflection that we wanted, um, this had more to do with making something compact. This is a micro-machined silicon uh, object that has been coated, and um, it needed to slip in behind a detector and terminate light that would have otherwise been reflect reflected. And it's, it, it needed to fit in a very small region, but it didn't need to be incredibly black. It, probably, it needed to be greater blackness and refle uh, reflectance, uh, absorptance higher than 0.9. And uh, it's probably like point, at the low, low end of the band, it's probably like not 0.95, and at the, in the optical, it actually is quite good. But where it's actually being used is around 0.95 or better. Um, so that's another place where you can play that kind of game. Um, and there, in this case, given the bandwidth that was required, um, a, a traditional design, um, it would have required multiple layers to do this and it, it's easier to make this than the other structure. This is a piece of carbon nanotube, 
and um, uh, been pulled out and photographed. But if you think about it, it's kind of the inspiration for this part. They're essentially these long needles. The photons come in, and they're slowly being absorbed as they go down along the length. Uh, next slide, please. And um, so for carbon nanotubes, which are mostly used in, in, uh, in, our, in my lab, in the, in the, more in the infrared, in the optical, but they actually, if, if you look at them, um, we've had some samples we've made that are quite long and um, can kind of make things of that length um, or less, but that is kind of the maximum length I can imagine making, probably more like 200 is better. But if you play with the, the essentially the filling fraction, the density of the material, you can see that it actually is a reasonable um, material in the, you know, down in the below, down to a, about a terahertz. Um, Next slide, please. And um, so where one place you can use that behavior is if you can use it for passive cooling. So this are, these are various materials, and I'm not going to read them all, um, but the ones of particular interest are up here, and these are the carbon nanotubes. Um, and, and they are pretty effective um, at the one problem, or one, not problem, one uh, um, challenge is, uh, so we do a lot of superconducting stuff, and the substrate material, the way they're bonded down is magnetic, and we don't really like some of those materials, so we actually haven't integrated them into our sensors, but um, at, for warmer t sensors, where it's less of a problem, um, they're, they, they definitely, they're fine. I am not confident I would use them uh, below the temperatures I plotted here for, um, the other thing is they can act as a getter, I guess is my other concern with them. But they do have a place. They're incredibly, um, if, especially if you pattern the material underneath them, kind of playing the same game that was played with the, uh, the um, metal absorber I played, you can make something incredibly black with them. Okay, next slide. So um, our funding for this research, uh, this is not the main thrust of what we do. These are things where we filled in holes uh, in various projects. So, uh, but the work we're doing, which is more directed towards doing astrophysics and studying cosmology, is funded uh, by a, a variety of, of um, sources, and they're listed here. Next uh, slide, please. And so, just summarize for the anti reflection coatings, uh, the broadband metal material systems, they're fairly advanced and they work um, quite well, quite happy with the wear. Technology potential enables compact terahertz imagers, spectrometers, planetary mode sensing. Um, the use of silicon, you have to think a little bit about silicon is not a dielectric, it's actually a semiconductor. Um, so you need to use very good material or you need to adequately address what other radiation is impinging upon the lens. So that's something to keep in mind. It's a feature. Uh, <laughs> In our case, it, we run so cold, it doesn't matter, because they, they really they freeze out. So, but we have, um, we have contemplated, and we are using some of these lenses warm, and I won't read the other ones. Um, OK, uh, next slide. And we have some other plans uh, that, of how to advance these technologies for uses uh, mostly astro in the astrophysical context. Thank you.